Welcome, everyone, to episode 233 of Just Joshing. I am your host, Joshua Pentelaresco. I write stuff in podcast two. Today, I conclude my conversation with Robert Angus. Robert is the book binder at the Octavia Book Bindery. And, uh, yeah, this one this one's very specifically about book binding, like this part of the conversation. And it's really interesting. I, I thought, like I said, book binding is not... A, an art form I'm very, very familiar with. And in the short time I had with Robert, I learned a little bit more about it, which is really good. But more importantly, I learned a little bit more about like kind of his approach, just to how he approaches book binding, kind of the future of what he wants to do in, in the industry, and just a hint of just some of the nuances that are in, in the art form, because it is an art form, and uh, a rarer one these days. So I'll just go into the conversation and... Uh, We'll talk a little bit more afterwards. Okay. But so if it's just in there, just hallucinating something nasty about oneself doesn't make one nasty. No. Right. Um, you know, like thoughts on what we do. It's it's awesome, and it's rare, and it's fun. Every day is fun, and it's education because every day we learn something new. Yeah, all this shows great care, actually. That's the one thing I like. I was thinking about this coming in here was, you know, this is this is not something you see around the mill every day, which is one of the, the appeals oh, to it. Unless you work in a book binder. Well, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But I mean, but I mean, I mean, you said this yourself at the beginning. There's only four in the in the province, and right, and four left. I mean, when I started book binding in Calgary, there was seven binders. And, you know, some of them were just in people's houses, and some of them, but they were all professional bookbinders, and they were all active. Yeah. And competing. It was a it was a busy, healthy industry. Now, it's, we're the last one here, for a thousand miles in any direction. Well, even Edmonton, those three bookbinders are trade bookbinders, they're, you know, they're basically factory floors. Yeah, no, no. Which and I, what we do is, is, even though we still do some of the trade stuff, like the oh, sure. binding and the you know some basic repairs and stuff, we gear everything towards this is hand bound. This is the traditional old style way of doing things. We don't have the big machines that are common now. Um, there was a book binder yesterday, and I know that he was he was intending to be helpful on one hand, but he also, tongue in cheek, tends to take a piss out of me on a regular by trying to one up me on his on his skill level. Yeah, the guy's got 50 years on me, right? And he's a great book binder when it comes to his experience, and he's one of the world's greats. But we're in a different league. He's doing this one very, 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 very specific niche style, which he very rarely moves away from. In fact, I don't think he ever has in the time that I've known him. Ah. And does some very specific work, which is fantastic, right? Like, he has the bar raised for that sort of level of binding style, which, you know, takes decades to master, right? But myself, I mean... I'm doing stuff that comes out of my head. I'm doing art bindings. I'm doing exciting things. I'm drawing out these beautiful creative designs that I've designed and am executing them in gold and leather and, you know, beautiful paper and, you know, yeah, for me, that's beautiful stuff. Um, I used to be a jeweler before I was a book fighter. And, and I say jeweler, I was a jewelry designer rather than, like, a jeweler jeweler like I couldn't be called a goldsmith I was a silversmith if you want to call that uh, business but what I really did was I was designing jewelry and wax for other jewelry companies and you know making stuff in wax well I don't see it in gold I can visualize it in gold but I can't see it in gold I was designing these things and they were turning around and selling them um, and making a killing off of my work, so right? Like, but at the same time, I mean, could I make a book in gold? Heck yeah. Yeah. Right? Could I design something with a whole bunch of gems? Yes. Absolutely I could. Is there anybody that can afford that? Probably not. You know, I mean, I don't, you know, I've had a couple of, uh, a couple of nobility type folk buy books off of us, but not to that generous degree. And, uh, and in most cases, when somebody's getting leather that's for like a funeral book or a reception book or a wedding album or 
you know, a gift for Christmas for somebody that they're taking like uh, a club edition novel and having it rebound in leather, right? Um, sometimes they let me play with it, sometimes they don't. It's just, you know, lots of people come in with ideas and uh, throw those ideas down. I want this, I want this, I want this, and it comes out being the gaudiest thing in the world, but it's their book. Yeah. So, um, you know, lots of people come in here with, uh, with, you know, champagne taste and beer budgets. Yes. Right? But we try and give them something that at least looks like baby duck. Yes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so at the very well, you, you, you do what you can, right? Well, right? I mean, yeah, that's yeah. the thing, though, is that in where we are at in this industry is a very inter- interesting place because the people that do find out about us, usually they're the ones with a book repair that they need done or their personal Bible with lots of notes that they don't want to let go of. And they come in and they... You know, they think that having bought this Bible at Chapters 20 years ago um, for $25, mm-hmm. they think that I should be able to fix it for 10 Nope. Right? And I'm like, well, you bought this book for $25 10 years ago in, you know, at discount in a retail shop that was just dumping it, and you want me to fix it. Like, what do you think my time is worth? It'll take me two hours to fix this thing. Right? Where else are you going to take it to? Nowhere. Right? Literally nowhere. And, or what? They, you know, lots of people come in here with their duct taped books. Right? So, so literally nowhere. And, unless they're going to send it off somewhere else in the world. Um, or, they just don't get it done. Right? But they think that if they can replace it for X dollars, that I should be able to work for those X dollars. And you can't pay the bills. Like, I'm not a rich guy, you know? So what it kind of comes down to is how do I value my time? How do they value my time? And to that end, like we're, we're also kind of s- splitting the company in a sense right now so that my apprentices can take on those jobs that serve a wider community and I can move up and continue doing the... The restoration jobs and the designer jobs that I want to do, um, without having to worry too much about the about the trade binding stuff, which they do an excellent job of, and it trains them well to do a great job, so that when they move up into the higher realms of things, the art, more artistic realms, or the more um, exacting quality things, like the, the restorations, we do in a very particular way, which most other restoration people don't. Right, like a lot of them go this weird cons- conservation route, which is um, to retain as much of the garbage as they can, and it doesn't get very artistic. You know, it doesn't get very creative. They, you know, they're great at what they do. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm not interpreting their stuff in a negative way, but it's the approach. They're, they, the approach yeah. is different. Yeah. Um, they're trying to retain something else, and it, it's you know that industry has gone through a few different interpretations over the years too. Like there was a time when. Um, if you were conserving a book, you made the leather a different color than the original leather so that people could tell what the difference was, ah. right? That this is not the same as the original. You're not trying to match the original. Then there's this other group, it's more common now, that are trying to match the original so it blends in yeah. and that you barely notice. And that's what I do, or at yeah. least what I try to do. And then there's this, this other group of like museum enthusiasts that, uh, that think that everything should be treated as if it's some sort of rare object, um, you know, one of a kind, you know, Coptic binding from the, from the you know, 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago. And it's not. It's somebody's fucking paperback comic book. Yes. Right? So is it rare? No. There's like 100,000 of these things. Is it important? No. It's a, it's a piece of pulp. It's, it's pulp fiction, literally. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a piece of pulp with some toner on it. I mean, it's... Is it valuable? No. Even if the guy's collecting comic books, it's not valuable. Like, 50 years from now when he's dead, they'll be selling it for 25 cents at a garage sale. You know, it's, the reality of things is that if it's important to you, that's what's important. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that how many copies of that first edition of Superman are out there not many that's what makes it rare and valuable I wouldn't rebind one no right would I mend a paper cut on it no no you know what I mean at that 
thing. I don't want somebody getting angry at me and saying, well, you didn't do it right. Well, fine. You, you, can't, win, you can't win in those situations yeah, no matter exactly. what. But if it's, yeah. if it's somebody's family Bible and the pages are torn and it's falling apart because they left it in their attic for 30 years, right? Of course I'm going to repair that in the best way that I can and according to their budget because most people don't have a big budget. No. Well, no, and, and like I said, you, at the end of the day, you got you got to look at, again, what's viable for your time, right? Well, and, I mean, and, that's and, the thing is that I'm not yes. going to do a job for less than my worth. Yeah. But my, my employees, the apprentices, can. And so at the end of the day, somebody says, well, you know, I don't want this book bound in the same in the same style of cover cool totally cool right I mean I can take their their leather bound 1920s Collier or J.M. Dent um, cheapy mass produced leather book and stick a cloth cover on it but I'll make sure that the cloth cover at least looks really nice yes you know um, I want in a sense to upgrade their book not downgrade it I'm not going to use duct tape no you know a lot of people will not bookbinders but just average people yep and at the same time I mean shite dude there's lots of people out there that I, I was looking online yesterday at bookbinders on Facebook mm-hmm. and just you know people calling themselves bookbinders or book repair people or whatever and there is some of the craziest craziest bad stuff out there you know like and really really crazy bad stuff and it might actually get Although although you are right, there's always going to be books because bookstores are by and large disappearing. There's going to be more. There's probably going to be probably for a degree for the next few years a lot more of that crazy coming up because you be- know I think the what it really comes down to is because of the because of the lack of training, mm-hmm. people are self training. Mm-hmm. That's part of it. And yeah. they're watching YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. And you know I even had a. Hello? Uh, I, I've seen you use this as an end paper for models. Yep. Can I do that? Yep. Okay, perfect. Yep. Um, it's oh, what I prefer oh. to use it for. It's no good as a cover material because okay. it scratches too easy. Perfect. It's just going to be great for what I'm yep. um, Beautiful. That's kind of the thing is that uh, there was a... Even a restoration artist, a man who is a master bookbinder in England, who's... You know, I have a, a great respect for him for the work that he does. Um, said something to me yesterday that I was appalled by. He says, yeah, the only thing that we do is this, and it's, uh, and I'm like, dear God, man, like, that's the crappiest kind of binding style I could even imagine for this. But he's like, you know, again, he was one of the people that suggested that I buy a machine to do our gluing. I'm like, no, right? It's a perfect binding machine. I'm not going to use that because, A, it devalues everything that we've ever done. Number one, I mean, we do stuff by hand. We teach to do stuff by hand. And the reason why is because even if they didn't have the the equipment that we have, they could still do it as a business in the future without all of this equipment, without any access to equipment, nothing but a knife and a folder and a, and a ruler, and still be able to make a living book binding. It's, to me, it's a career, but it's also an art and it's also um, an exacting skill and set of skills. Mm-hmm. But in the sense of like some of the things that people do, no way, I couldn't allow that. And I still have people making fun of me in the bookbinding communities, uh, you know, because now we're all on Facebook and oh, yeah, yeah. whatever, and we all com- you know communicate in these groups and share ideas and teach each other and bounce ideas back and forth and stuff. But like I was saying, this master bookbinder is like, we would do it this way. I'm like, no, no, not in my studio, you wouldn't, right? And the reason why is because we want things done properly, but also, um, you know, we, we aim for two things, accuracy and speed, right? Accuracy, it has to look right, and it has to be as, you know, there is no perfection, and we try to make it look right. Mm-hmm. You know, and although we aim for as perfect as possible, absolutely. If we wasted hundreds of hours aiming for that that pristine perfect, you know, whatever, nothing gets done. This imaginary line of perfect, then we'd never achieve anything. We'd never do anything. There was a 
there's a, a society um, of some society somewhere in the world, and I was reading their their thing in order to become a member. You have to send them a piece of your work, right? Just a sample of your work once every month or once every year or something like that to prove to them that you are of their caliber. What's, right? what's their caliber? Their caliber was so precise within a tenth of a millimeter precise, like just stupidly perfect. Nobody can afford that, right? I mean, literally, nobody can afford that kind of work. And unless they are some strangely high-end billionaire that loves to spend money on books, um, I mean, to repair somebody's 20-year-old paperback and fix the dog ears, yeah, there's ways to do that. There are ways to do it that will cost them $10,000, and there are ways to do it that will cost them $100. Do you think somebody's going to spend $10,000 on a paperback? I highly doubt it. Unless it's like some crazy rare thing. You know? Yeah, no, it, it, it'd be ridiculously rare. The only way I even think it, right? And, and even then, I'm mean, like, I'm trying to look for a better way even but, at that but point. But this is what I'm saying is that yeah. if to do it to according to those standards, the bookbinder would fail as a business. Oh, absolutely. Because they can't meet those standards on a day to day basis. And unless they've got a patron that is paying for them to live and ex- you know, just go through life. But at, even at that point, if you're only doing one book every few months, how do you make money off of that? You can't. There's no value to the world that way. Whereas, um, you know, for example, uh, a lot of our clients can't pay for the paper repairs that they need. And so the shortcut method is don't dye the paper. Mm-hmm. So it comes out bright white against a cream-colored background, right? They don't care because as long as the book's not falling apart, right? I care because it doesn't look right. But at the end of the day, whatever their budget is, you know, and it has to be an agreeable amount based on what we do. Like, they have a budget of X dollars. We charge by the hour X dollars. And if all they can afford is 20 minutes of my time, then so be it. 20 minutes is what you'll get. 20 minutes is what you'll get. Right? Um, that said, I always try to give something nice. I always try and give something a little bit extra. Yeah. You know? That's, um, just, that's just good business. Well, I mean, it's it's nice because it's an art. Yeah. You know? So if the person's only ever pitching 150 bucks or something, like an hour's worth of work, for um, a rebinding of, a, of an old book, and they've picked a color of cloth, and this is what they like. I'll throw a little bit of gold work on it, yeah. Just, just to make it that much more special. It's, it's not, it's not a library book that's just quickly stamped with the title on the spine with an ugly font, right? If I throw a, uh, just a little embellishment on the top and the bottom of the, of the spine, and maybe a, an embossing of like a snowflake or something on the front, or, or something, right? It makes it just that extra little bit special, and. You know, it's an individual, unique book that they will like to show off. Like, it's just as much a marketing thing as it is me wanting my clients to be happy with what they got. Absolutely. And also that this is this is my work, right? It speaks it, about me, but it's still not a psychology thing. It's more a matter of this is my reputation of making something just slightly nicer than what people well, paid for. It, it, I would go so far as to say it's, there's, there's a little bit of self-respect to what you're doing. Like, you, you, you take pride in your work. And I think that's fair to say. And I, th- I think also you, you care. You care. Well, this is the thing. Yeah. And this is what I'll leave you off with. Yeah. I still have to go back to work. Yep. The, the main thing that I try my best to live by, and it's probably why my queue does not disappear quickly, and by queue I mean like the waiting list of clients, um, is that good enough is so far below me that it's not worth doing. Good enough is amateur. I agree. Good enough is just okay, and I'm not just okay. I want people to be happy with what they get. I want people to be excited about their stuff. I want them to show it off. I want them to want to carry their library around in their car, just like in special cases, just so that they can show their friends. Yeah. I know collectors of marbles 
that have antique marbles Absolutely. and carry them around in freaking briefcases in their cars. I've seen I've seen you know, it. It's, yeah, I've seen it. And, and this is sort of the thing, is that um, I want people to be happy with what they get from us. We guarantee our work, so if anything's material materially wrong with it, we'll fix it. Um, hopefully it never happens, but I mean, there's been occasions when we've accidentally stamp a title wrong and we'll fix it mm -hmm. right you do a hundred titles in a week and your eyes start going across but Fair enough. but at the same time it's like we try to do our very best we try to make it look right we try to make it perfect and beautiful um the you know it's it's a process it's an art it's a it's a whole bunch of skills there's some science involved and it's just beautiful and fun and fantastic but it will die as an industry if people stop using it. And I think that there will always be repair jobs because there's always going to be books, at least in the sense that there will always be antique books that somebody wants to save for the next generation somehow. I think that restoration will be a thing as long as people still value the object. And I also think that... Uh, that uh, you know, making beautiful gift objects like guest books and photo albums and um, journals and uh, and things like that will always be a thing. Um, again, so long as people still value objects, um, which we're humans, we're monkeys, we love objects, right? But again, the main thing is is that uh, is that uh, in that respect, we will always have a place so long as we can pivot and change what we're doing. But at the same time, as an art, it just kind of comes down to how do we want to express it? How do we want to reach the world with it? And how does the world want to help give patronage to these to these arts? All right. And last thing, how can people find you? Um, in a few ways. I wouldn't recommend... Uh, uh, no, I would recommend just dropping by. I wouldn't recommend... Um, dropping by in the middle of the night uh, or first thing in the morning because in the middle of the night if I'm here in the middle of the night I'm usually like trying to get stuff done and it's a terrible distraction um, in the early morning we're usually not here um, because uh, most of us show up at different times in the morning but we're also trying to get stuff done for the clients for the day um, so my recommendation is to stop by in the afternoon if you're going to stop by and we're in Calgary, Alberta. Um, right now, the address is at uh, 10th Street and 8th Avenue Southwest. If they see this in the future and we're not there, it's a good thing to check online because we'll be on Google or uh, Facebook or whatever is going to be popular at the time. We try and have a, a page on. Um, they can find us at Google um, at Octavia Book Bindery. They can find our website at octaviapress.ca. Uh, they can find us on Facebook at Octavia Book Bindery. They can find us on Instagram at Octavia Book Bindery. I never check my Twitter. I mean, don't even bother. Um, I, I'm trying to uh, get somebody else to run it because I obviously can't. Um, the uh, but our phone number here at the studio is five eight seven seven zero zero six five seven five. You can call it. You can text it. Don't send me pictures. I hate it. Um, and send those to our email address at octaviapress at hotmail.com. All right. So, so two last things. And that was my conversation with Robert Angus. Rob and staff of the Octavia Book Bindery are available in the afternoons. Stop by during the weeks or week even or on weekends at 1040 8th Avenue Southwest. The website is octaviapress.ca if you want to read some of Robert's works you can get some information about that there as well as as what they do and how they do it i want to take a moment to thank each and every person that i content met and interviewed that day even people i didn't interview that day um everybody was courteous professional they treated me good uh it was a great learning experience for me um most of all i want to thank rob for giving me the whole day um not just him, but his staff, and for some of the things we talked about off the air. Um, so, Rob, thanks very much for doing this. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. I appreciate it very much. 
and you guys should definitely go down to the Octavia Book Bindery if you want to see your books restored, repaired, whether it, they're you know, more of a trade variety or something a little bit more artistic. It's definitely a cool place, and you should definitely check it out. And now that that uh, this conversation's finished, I got I'm going to talk a little bit about the future. Um, my Patreon page is coming up in literally two weeks from this date, March first. It launches. Um, I'm really nervous, like in a Peter Parker kind of way. Um, Peter Peter Parker kind of way. It kind of works like this. Uh, when Spider-Man always fights the bad guys, he's always scared. He's always that's why he cracks a zillion jokes a second because he's scared to fucking death. And uh, I am scared, but good scared. And I'm really looking forward to the challenge ahead of me. Um, saying you have a Patreon is one thing. You know, doing it day in and day out is going to be another, and it's going to be a major investment of my time for the next year. Um, I'm going to give it a good, I'm good try to see how, get people to come on board and see if, if, I believe I'm worth it. I believe my, my time, my effort, what I do has value. And I think enough people given the opportunity will see the exact same thing. So to everybody that's gotten, that's been on my show, who's gotten this far, thank you very, very much for what you've done. More is coming. The best is yet to come. And that will do it for another episode of Just Joshing. So if you want to support the podcast, you can do so in a number of different ways. You can subscribe and share this podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or Podomatic itself. Do so. Subscribe, listen, download. Let people know about this show however you can. If you want to support me some more, you can buy my books. The Watcher Storm Dancer Wandering God is available through mirrorworldpublishing.com. Com. Definitely go there, order my books, buy my books. You can go to Amazon, Kobo, any other electronics like website to buy my books that way. You can go to Indigo, you can go to Barnes & Noble. I'm there too. Leave comments, share the work. My YouTube channel is Joshua Pentola Rusco. Um, I've been definitely been updating it a lot more lately. There's 116 conversations up there right now um, featuring people like Robert J. Sawyer, Simon Rose, um, geez, my mind is just drawing a blank at this moment. It's been a long day, but there's a lot of amazing conversations up there. You should definitely check them out. They're awesome. Beyond all that, there's my patron in two weeks. Starting next week, you'll get all the info you need there. But beyond all that, stay inspired. Do what you're called to do. And above all else, be true to yourself. You know, in this this day and age, so you got all you can do. So thanks everybody for listening, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Josh, Josh.